The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gap, episode 708, for Monday, May 7th, 2018. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab. We are the show that takes your tips, your questions, your cool stuff found. We mix it all together, try and form a cohesive agenda that we sometimes stick to. With the goal being that we're going to answer your questions, we're going to share your tips, we're going to share your cool stuff found, we're going to share some cool stuff found of our own so that we can all learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. Yes, it's five. For those of you that are just joining us from 2017, we've upped the ante. We've come up. I guess we increased it by 25%. Is that right? Or is that just 20%? See, that's no, it's 25% increase. Is it? Right? Because we were at four. Going from four to five? Yeah. Yeah, 25% right. of four there you is go. one. Yeah. So that. Yeah. yeah. Hey. So that's, that's how it's going to be. Sponsors for this episode include... Smiles PDF Pen version 10, a new one that adds watermarks, custom headers, and all kinds of stuff. We will talk more about that in a minute. And also a new sponsor for this show, Simple Contacts. We're at simplecontacts.com slash MGG or using coupon code MGG. You save 30 bucks off of your first order. This is a cool service. I can't wait to tell you more about it here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here... And pollen infested Fairfield, Connecticut. This is John Efron. Yeah, I was noticing that uh, the plants all went poof last night for us here. Probably earlier for you, probably a week or two ago, right? For you, but but up here, the trees are are raining their seed upon yeah my property and my vehicle. Yeah, so, mm. yeah, yeah. Tis the season. Yeah, they're doing what they got to do. That's how it goes. That's right. I do want to say, and I know this is, uh, I didn't say this in last week's show, so many of you might not hear it, but um, I'm speaking in Princeton, New Jersey tomorrow night, uh, Monday or Tuesday, May 8th, and all are welcome to the, it's at pmug-nj, rather, pmug-nj.org. So I just wanted to say that. I, I, I've tweeted it out and I've put it on Facebook and stuff, so hopefully folks know what I like to say in the show and I missed it last week. So yeah, I think our buddy uh, Kenny's out there. Maybe he'll stop by. I think he's yeah. I think he's further out than that. I don't think he's too close to to Princeton. But oh, who, who knows? Okay. I do know some listeners are are coming, and I uh, should be fun. So it's always a good time. They're a good group there. Uh, what are you gonna be talking about? Uh, I have yeah. I've sort of revamped my my almost decade old running your Mac lean, clean, and mean presentation, and so I'm doing it as a run your Apple devices lean, clean, and mean. But really, what I'm doing is showing people a lot of tips and cool stuff found that they can use on both their Macs and iPhones. So you know, it's good. It's fun. Shall uh, shall we get to the show here, my friend? Yeah. Why not? All right. Well, we will start here with Joe. Actually, let's start with some some cool stuff found, tips, whatever you want to call. I guess this is cool stuff found. He said, uh, my apologies if I missed this, but back from MacGeekab703, you were talking about geotagging in photos. Uh, he says, unfortunately, I would hazard to guess that the majority of DSLRs out there do not geotag photos. He says, I just spent 800 bucks on one that does not geotag he says anyway in photos uh you can do it and we talked about that where you select the location and you can uh you can do that but his cool stuff found is an ios app called geotag photos and he says this iphone app keeps a log of my location while i'm shooting with my dumb dslr when i import my photos to my mac i use the companion app to geotag the photos uh, and update the metadata, adding the geolocation information based on the timestamp that my iPhone had at the time. So that's a pretty cool thing, right? Because your iPhone can know where you are, and it can also know the time. And so this geo uh, Geotag Photos app correlates the two and will auto-populate with at least the location of your iPhone at the time that the picture was taken, which, if they were both on your person, is pretty darn close to exactly where it's going to be. It's pretty good, huh, John? That is. Now, it's surprising, though, because my 
it's not a DSLR. Right. I'll call it, a, call it a point and shoot, which is a Nikon, but it does have GPS. So really, yeah, yes, that's pretty good. Now you have to activate it, and I think it's not on by default because it does draw a small amount of power, even when the camera is uh, is technically off. I think sure, uh, yeah, because it's got to keep its keep its place. So yeah, but. But I do recall when I was looking at DSLRs, I do believe some DSLRs have a GPS add-on. If they have like an accessory port, you may uh, want to yeah. look into to see if there's an option like that. Cool. I mean, there's also the, well, I think their day has passed. I mean, I remember back in the day, the uh, the iFi card was great. It was using yeah, Wi-Fi not, That doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a lot of cameras have Bake some version of that in using Wi-Fi for geolocation. Right. So, uh, so you may want to poke around your camera and see if uh, either of those are available. Uh, again, with mine, it was off by default, but I, I turn it on because I do like to have those coordinates most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. And then Jan uh, has a, a, a yet another solution for electronics that have uh, overly bright lights on their faces that that bother us. Um, he said, uh, I have a tip uh, where the light actually gives off a status indicator at, that you might want to see sometimes. So instead of covering it up, you might want to have the option to see it. He says, what I do is I use one of those webcam covers uh, like I would use on my MacBook or iMac. He says, you can get them from Amazon for a few bucks. And I put a link to, to one of them that I found a three pack actually in the show notes. And they stick right on. I mean, they're built to stick on your MacBook or your iMac. Uh, and they have a little slider so that you can cover or not cover your webcam. But obviously, it could also be used for these lights. And you could slide it back and forth so that you can see the lights when you're troubleshooting. And then slide the cover closed when, uh, when you're finished. So I like it. Pretty good. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So thank you, Jan. Cool. Very cool, in fact. All right. Uh, any thoughts on that, John, before we move on to slick? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's little, good good little, thinking. Uh, yeah, a little better than a, than a tape. Mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. little more stylish. Yeah, a little more functional. Yeah, there you go. Cool. All right. Uh, another one, another cool stuff found, rather, this, one, this time from listener Ken. And I will find it. I know. There it is. Uh, Ken sa says... Uh, I hate when I search for a specific word in messages on my Mac, it shows lots of text, but it never highlighted the word. So for me, it's very hard to find the word, but I found a Mac app called Chatology made by the folks at FlexiBits. Uh, he says it was more expensive than I thought at 1999. Uh, it won't allow you to respond to a message because that can only be done with iMessage or with the messages app. He says, uh, but it definitely does what I wanted for searching. And that's indeed what Chatology does is um, really gives you a powerful archive to your um, archive utility to your, uh, for your, all your iMessages. You can search them and it, that's really what it's, it's made for is searching and hunting and finding. So it's pretty cool. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I have, I, I, I feel like I tested it a couple of years ago, but I don't use it regularly, but I had forgotten about it until I got Ken's note. And then it's like, Oh yeah, there's times when that would be really handy to have something that will be more intelligent about searching my iMessages and text messages. So yeah, cool stuff. You got some cool stuff found this week, John, more cool I stuff. Did. Found. Yeah. So I was out shopping and we're not going to tell you about my mower that I'm having a problem with because that was the initial reason I went to the store was to get a spark plug for it because it's not working, right? So evidently you are going to tell us about the mower that you were having a problem with. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I just did. That's but, what I'm um, saying. But that's it. I, it but we're not going to diagnose uh, why lawnmowers don't work here. I've, okay. I've been through this. <laughs> but while I was in the store, I was like, you know what? I just got this new Wink Hub 2. And uh, I was in Home Depot. And uh, but one of the uh, products, um, when you run the app, so there, there are two parts to this environment here. One, of course, is, is the hub, as I mentioned last week. And then the other part is their app. 
And the thing is, you can look in their app to see what devices they uh, natively talk to. Mm -hmm. And one of them, which I thought was cool and I thought I'd try out, because it's not terribly expensive, um, Cree makes what they call connected smart bulbs. And basically the electronics for doing all the smarts are built into the bulb, which is why as an LED bulb, it costs about 15 bucks versus most LED bulbs right now. I think you can get for like a buck or two, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Well, um, so because well got the smarts but Cree, the- Cree's bulbs are generally more expensive than your average LED bulb anyway. They, they, they have the reputation of having higher quality parts. Um, and so you know that so they so you will pay more for a Cree bulb than you would for just a, a regular run of the mill like i'm talking about their non smart bulb equivalents you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah so but yeah still 15 decided, bucks for a smart bulb is is cheaper than you'll pay for like a philips hue bulb so that's pretty good yeah and it's also why at, at least in this particular store i go to all the hue bulbs have the uh uh tamper uh the device that screams if you cut the wires and try to run away with it. Okay. okay. <laughs> because I guess they are rather pricey compared to this one where this sure. one is just in a box. Sure. But um, here's the nice thing about this bulb is that, so they advertise, so one, I saw that it appeared in the, in the Wink app. So I'm like, oh, well, let me pick, a, pick one of these up here. If you, if you go to their page, they tell you that, oh, well, hey, um, our bulb works with Wink, with Zigbee, with smart things and with Wemo. So it's just compatible with everything. Well, I doesn't that, that essentially, doesn't essentially that, they're all Zigbee. I think I was just going to say, doesn't that mean they're all Zigbee? Or doesn't. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's right, but still that's great. Yeah. But it was cool. So, you know, I went into the app. It's like add a new device. It's like, okay, um, I'm ready. And then what you do is you screw the bulb in and the wing cub sees the bulb appear and it's like, okay, you want to give it a name? And it's like, yep. And, so now when I talk to uh, my A friend, yes. all I say is turn on table lamp, which is what I have the bulb screwed into. And sure. it turns it on and I can say, set the brightness to a value between one and a hundred. And it does that. Cool. It's just pretty cool. It, it cool. was, it was just so seamless. I mean, it just, it worked as it should. That's great. Hey, now, I don't think I'm going to oh. go full bore on these because, I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to replace all my bulbs with $15 LED bulbs because that gets kind of pricey. I may look at dimmers next to well, replace my dimmers so, with smart dimmers. So that's interesting because listener Robert wrote in and um, it, it was in response to our conversation last week where he said that um, we were talking about the, the oh, yeah, lifespan yes. of the bulbs, right? And he says, when they mention the theoretical 20 or 30 year expected lifespan, they're actually referring only to the calculated, of course, not measured lifespan of the LED light source itself. He says, uh, however, all common LED lights are DC powered. So to use them in a standard lamp or light fixture, there is an AC to DC voltage converter stuffed inside the base of the bulb. Basic electronics tells us that the converter consists of discrete components such as a transformer, coil, capacitors, and or resistors. And the quality of these components varies a lot from the brand name LEDs to the no name ones. So when the converter fails, the light will fail, even though the LEDs themselves might be good for, you know, 20 to 30 years. He says, and that's not even factoring in the possible inclusion of like a Zigbee or potentially even Wi-Fi radio in, you know, a smart bulb. And then he goes on. So then thank you for that part of this, Robert. That's awesome because I knew because with my personal experience, these bulbs, like I, I don't think I've had an LED bulb last five years yet. So um, they, they just tend to burn Ooh. out. Yeah. Cause because, I have, but I have had catastrophic failures of they, CFLs. Right. Well, that's one very different. That yeah. burned and smoke came out. I, I literally saw the smoke coming out of it. And that, that was kind of scary. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's bad. That's yeah, potentially mercury filled smoke. You don't want that. But but yeah, mm-hmm. so I've had like the the converters or whatever. I mean, these, you know, those LED bulbs get hot with those converters in there. Um but then Robert goes on to say, um one of my pet peeves as a smart home integrator is the predisposition by consumers to buy smart bulbs instead of smart switches. So this is just what you were just saying, John. He says there are some trade-offs, but the majority of the time, smart bulbs are the dumb choice. Uh, And he's written a blog post about it that we're happy to link to here. Uh, And so I asked him what smart bulbs he recommends. And he says, or sorry, 
what smart switches he recommends. And of course, the reason for this is if you've got, say, you know, four bulbs in your living room all tied to one switch, well, you could replace all four of those bulbs with smart bulbs, or you could just replace the switch. And then that way, A, all you're doing is paying for the switch and using the bulbs you already have. And B, you don't have to do what John and I have to do in our homes and put those little switch covers over the switches that are now controlled by our smart bulbs so that people don't flip them on and off um, accidentally. So uh, he <laughs> says, I really like the Lutron, uh, both the Cassetta and the new Radio RA2 Select. He says for the Cassetta, the key to, is to avoid starter kits and buy the Pro Hub only, which is sold a la carte. Um, he says it's got a Telnet command line interface and it gives you max flexibility. It works with the Lutron app, with HomeKit, with the Amazon A lady, with um, with the G lady, and with Smart Things. Um, and he says although the Radio RA2 is sold only through dealers, most electricians will have them. So um, I'll see if he can give us, and perhaps this Cassetta one uh, is available. I, I'm literally reading this email. I didn't prep it for the show. I just, as we got into this topic, I remembered. So I grabbed no, my I phone. No, I saw it. It's, a, found it's, the it's email. good stuff. So you got to yeah. do a cost benefit analysis. Right. Should I pay 50 bucks for a smart dimmer, which I'm, I'm going to venture that's about what they're going to cost or oh. yeah, like in my case, for example, so I got six bulbs in my kitchen. Do I want to spend 60 bucks on bulbs or do I want to spend, or do I want to leave the bulbs that are in there there yeah. and maybe spend less than that on upgrading my switches, which for, for at least that room are just simple on off switches. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you're right. It's about 50 bucks, um, for, uh, for a switch. So I will, I will find one of these and this is more, I'm, I'm going to put it in the show notes, but, but know that this is un, unvetted. Um, only because we're kind of doing this in real time here. So, uh, um, yeah, but it's there. So there you go. Yeah. And then this led to a question. And then, so I noticed this and, and I fawned about this on my Twitter feed, which went to my Facebook. And that I like the attention to detail that the Wink app has in that it'll show an icon for the different bulbs that I have, Dave. And they're kind of like on the Mac, the icon represents, I, I forget what this is called, but uh, the icon accurately represents what the bulb look like, looks okay. like. So I have these older GE link bulbs and yeah, it shows me an right. icon that looks like they do. And then the Cree bulb, it shows an icon that looks like that one does with, you know, the cutouts and, the, and it's just like, that's really neat. And then our buddy Kenny uh, asked the question, which is a good question. And, and I, I think it was a good question because uh, I wanted to clarify what I was saying. And he's like, well, oh, this wink thing sounds pretty neat. Could I use wink? To implement HomeKit. Well, no. What he asked was, "Can right, you yeah, replace?" You, you have it in front of you there. Yeah, he was using his iPad as um, as his HomeKit hub, right? And and which you can do, right? You can designate. Well, is the iPad the hub, or is something else the hub? Well, that that the iPad is the hub, so you can designate. Um, an iOS device. I think it has to be an iPad. I don't know if a phone will do it, but, but you, it, it's iOS devices. So an iPad, an Apple TV, which technically is TV OS um, or HomePod, right? So one of those things, and, and what that allows you to do is control your HomeKit devices remotely. Otherwise you don't need a HomeKit hub. You can just control your HomeKit devices from your iPhone when you're in the house, but if you want to control things remotely, uh, you need some device to be that, that gateway, right. Between the outside world and the inside world. And, and so again, if you've got an Apple TV or a home pod speaker on your network, they will automatically become that hub, or you can designate an iPad to do it. And, and, you know, I would say plug it in, but then that will be your hub. So he was asking, does, would, you know, with this wink hub that John was talking about, would that replace the home kit hub? And the answer is no, not for home kit purposes, right? It, right? it serves a very similar purpose, although it does more than that. Right. So the home kit hub is just for the, um, for like timing and scheduling and all of that stuff, because you've got a device that's there, but it, it's not, 
the it's it like the the word the word hub is being used interchangeably for these two products and it's not really they're not doing the same thing the home kit hub does what we just described mm. remote access and like scheduling and things like that whereas the wink hub is the gateway without which you cannot talk to your smart bulbs right because they speak zigbee and you don't have any other device that speaks zigbee you have a device that speaks say wi-fi so the Wink Hub is the translator between Zigbee and Wi-Fi or Zigbee and Ethernet, you know, and, and I'm right. oversimplifying here, but that but that's essentially what it's doing. So two very different things. It also happens that the Wink Hub connects to the Internet so you can control your Wink bulbs remotely, but mm. it's still not HomeKit. I mean, and arguably Wink, the Wink Hub might be more full featured than what HomeKit can do. Well, in fact, I, I would I would actually make that argument, but yeah. But I mean, the similarity go. between the two is that you have a hardware device kind of doing a translation between. But that no, that's where language. there's that's where there's no similarity. That's the one thing where oh. they are not similar because you don't need a okay. HomeKit hub to talk to HomeKit devices. You need right? the Home app, right? You need a HomeKit device and an app that speaks HomeKit, which the Home app does, but there are many others that do as well. Yeah, it it it's like the Home HomeKit devices okay. are sort of sort of you know they stand on their own, uh, but there are things like the the Elgato stuff and the or the Belkin thing. Like Belkin makes the Wemo HomeKit bridge now, which does exactly what you're talking about. But that's not a HomeKit hub; that's a HomeKit bridge. The hub is an Apple only device that that lets you remotely control and have a device there for scheduling HomeKit stuff. It's very, it's very confusing because we've got these words that that we're interchanging and manufacturers are interchanging, but they're not doing the same things. So, yeah, there's no translation happening with the Apple HomeKit hub. But with the okay. Wink Hub, there's definitely translation, right? That because that's what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. If I had any HomeKit compatible devices, then I'd I'd know more. But I'm glad we're having this discussion yeah. because I'm sure I'm not the only one that's confused no. here. And I just decided because nothing that I have right now, as far as I know, I mean, I've run the Home app, and you know, it's like I, I can't find any anything that right, talks right. my language, and I'm like, okay. Um, whereas. Like I mentioned before, I have things that I know are already compatible with Wink, so that's the direction I took as far as my, uh, we'll say, smart home architecture. Can I say that? Yeah, I guess yeah. I can. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it's the Wink Hub, the Wink app, uh, and through the Wink app, not only can I you know, turn things on and off and, and stuff like that, but it also lets you do things like scheduling. Like some of the fe- like one of the features it has for lights, it's like, hey, you want me to do this kind of kind of make it look like there's somebody living in your house thing? Mm. <laughs> so it'll like randomly like turn lights on and off in like different rooms and stuff to make it look like there's somebody at home. Which, That's good. Cool. Uh, I may yeah. try that when I, you know, when I, I go on vacation or something like that just right. to uh, just right. for kicks. So as Warren in the chat room correctly points out at MacGeekGab.com slash stream, uh some home kit devices do need an, an in between a bridge, if you will. And and that's what we're talking about with the Wemo stuff or uh, some of Elgato stuff. You need that bridge so that it can talk to, you know, the devices that can't speak Wi-Fi on their own. That's really what it comes down to is, is it needs to get connected to your network. And so if the device can speak Wi-Fi on it or ethernet on its own, then it can work just fine directly with home kit. Otherwise it needs its own little translator. But again, that's not, you know, the scheduler or it could be, but it's the manufacturer's scheduler. That's, that's where it gets very confusing, right? Because you can have like right now in my house, I have, um, I've got the Philips hue bulbs, which are home kit compatible, but also, you know, compatible with the a lady and the G lady and all that stuff. Um, and also compatible with their own app. I have the ring stuff, which is not home kit compatible yet, but, Yes, compatible with things with like the A Lady and the G Lady and its own app. I have a couple of TP Link smart switches that are Wi Fi capable, so they don't need any Zigbee or anything like that. They just speak to Wi Fi. 
but they only work, they don't work with HomeKit either. It's like their app and then, you know, A-Lady and G-Lady. And uh, I think that's all I have. But it gets really confusing because only one of those things, the Hue bulbs work with HomeKit. So it starts, it's like, well, why in the world would I want to use HomeKit unless you're starting from scratch and don't have anything that's not HomeKit? And then, you know, maybe that starts to make sense. Or if you want to be a real geek, you can set up something called Home Bridge, which is actually pretty easy to set up. And what it will do is it runs on your Mac or you can run it on like your Synology disk station or something. And Homebridge is an app that runs in the background and translates between your non HomeKit devices and HomeKit. It provides um, essentially an interface to let HomeKit talk with non HomeKit devices. So if you have smart bulbs, like for you, John, with the Wink stuff, it would basically tell HomeKit, hey, cool, I've got some uh, additional Hue bulbs here. And then the HomeKit could talk to those. So you could set up Homebridge and and I, actually you probably have fun doing it. It's really not, it's not a huge chore, but, um, but anyway. Oh, uh, I think I tried to, oh, what's that compatibility uh, thing on Synology? Docker? Docker. Docker. Yeah. I thought there was a Docker package and there I tried is. to yeah. activate a couple and, and it just, the, the Docker is, uh, I'm, I'm not pleased with Docker. Because Docker. Docker <laughs> is something that is actually way easier to do from the command line than it is via Synology's web interface. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah, I mean, I got the Docker package, so it's a package through Synology, like uh, all the other, yeah, most other things you had. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was, uh, then it was like, oh, well, here, here's some Docker plugins that'll deploy this thing called uh, Homebridge. And I'm like, okay. But number one, they were like, oh, well, you got to manually edit this text file and put all these special values Correct. in here. So it's going to work. And I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. It should just work. You know, it should prompt you for this info. I shouldn't have to fiddle with a text file. But so, so actually, to Kenny's question, could I use Wink to do HomeKit? The thing is, if you want to fiddle with the... Mm -hmm. with Homebridge, yeah, but right. I would not recommend it. No, it's, I, it's really confusing. So, yeah, I, I you know, it at this point, and I find myself in these conversations with people a lot, I, my advice is don't go with HomeKit because you'll be confused as to what you can buy. I mean, I know you can buy all the stuff that says made for HomeKit, but it, it gets really frustrating for the average consumer to, to manage that, to be perfectly frank. It's way easier to go with like, you, you know, a lady or, or something like that, where you've just got, you know, tons of availability of things to work with. So, yeah. I mean, if you're starting off, look at the various vendors, whether they be wink or smart things or Apple has a home kit page, I'm sure that yep. says, okay, here's all the stuff that we work with. And I think the, the list is growing every day. Well, now that they've but I think the other, the, other vendors have more, uh, the other guys who, who have been doing this longer than Apple and right. are working on the standards and all that have more options, I would say. Um, though that may change. You never know. All right. We will move on from this. Tips. Yeah. Staying with the tips here. Uh, okay. So David from 707, which I will find here. We talked about... Um, Fios routers and what to do with them. And it, how specifically the question was, could w someone use uh, something like an Eero as the main router for the house and not have the Fios router uh, do the routing? And so the answer is yes, it's complicated, but you can make it easy. Uh, and we've, we got actually several emails from from many of you specifically david bill and john really were the three that that kind of pulled it all together so uh, bill i think said it best i think where is his email oh i got this huge pdf here uh bill said it best he said all you really need to know is three letters d m and z and what you do is you set up both the um Fios router and the Eero, and you put them both in normal routing mode because putting the Fios router in non-routing mode requires a huge 
uh, amount of configuration and also some specific sacrifice. Like you can't control your TV guide from outside the house. And there's, there's some things that you will sacrifice. So all you need to do is just leave them both in router mode. You will create what's called a double NAT scenario, which we always say is bad. And that's why you hear John like sucking wind in through his teeth. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, exactly. But the the reality is the way things, the way networks work today, DMZ isn't really nearly as bad as it, or, sorry, it, double NAT isn't nearly uh, as much of a problem as it used to be. And where it is a problem, you can bypass. And the way you bypass it is by setting your Fios router to point all unrequested in unsolicited inbound traffic to your router, which is, which it would be getting anyway, if it were your main router, it would, it would all be coming in. So you just tell the Fios router, look, anything that you come in, that comes in that you don't know what it's for, just pass a hundred, instead of ignoring it, which is what it would normally do, pass a hundred percent of it along to that device there. And then that's going to be your Eero or your Synology or, you know, whatever router you want to use. Netgear could even be an uh, Apple, right? Uh, and you tell it to do that. And then that device gets all of that traffic and it can be your router and it can do all your port forwarding and everything because it's getting all of that unsolicited traffic. And that process is called DMZ. It's the demilitarized zone. You are saying, fine, we are essentially turning off the firewall and flooding all the traffic one way. And it's to that device. And so you DMZ that device and it, it like, that's the, that's the advice for people with files. There is a great, if you want to go and, and do the nutty thing and and actually disable routing in your Fios router and lose some functionality uh, with your TVs, you can. And Allison Sheridan and Bart Bouchot's put together a great PDF about how to do all that. But um, you're better off just doing the DMZ thing in this day and age. So there you go. Yeah, as Brother Jay says in the chat room, unconditional traffic forwarding is is another way to think of the DMZ just takes everything and routes it right to that one device. And then it's up to that device to actually do the routing, which is what you want. So there you go. Good. Yeah, John. I look forward to the day when I can get fiber. Yes. You and <laughs> me both, today man. Is not, today is not that day. No, today is not that day. Uh, listener John actually sent in uh, on this same topic what he sent us was a link to dslreports.com, which is a great website for like geeky router type things. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and it's about the FIO stuff. And it's a chart that shows you the trade-offs between all the various configurations that you can do. Again, our recommendation is just go with the DMZ. However, if you don't want to do that or you want to know exactly what you're agreeing to and, and not agreeing to and all that stuff, um, this DSL reports page is awesome. So we'll link to that in the, in the show notes. They, um, they are, they are good folks there at DSL reports. So good, John moving on. I'm waiting. Okay. Wait, what are you waiting for? Waiting for the world to change? You know, I should just stop waiting and I should just, connect something to the fiber router that's the, on the pole next to my house. I should yeah. stop waiting. I, I should just get a ladder and just climb up there. And I, I'm sure I can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, you would also need to purchase service. It's not like the fiber is just, well, you know, the, the, the routable the from the, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, all I know is when I moved into my house, it had cable running into it and there were several channels that, I was receiving. That's and I wasn't very paying different. them anything yet. That's very different from internet service. But you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, that's pretty standard that you can get some level of cable on a non-provision line. So, I mean, as far as internet connection, I mean, just find a unsecured Wi-Fi access point in your neighborhood. All there right. you go, man. One last quick tip before we move on to uh, to other things, and this is from Ken. He says, for a long time, I've been looking for a keyboard shortcut to open the trash, and I found it. But the only way I can figure out how to do it is with Keyboard Maestro. And, and so he did, right? He created a keyboard shortcut where it opens the trash with Command-Shift-T. 
any program keyboard maestro to do it. I share this not because we all want to find a way to open the trash. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty specific request. Most, I don't, I rarely dig into the trash myself, Um, but it's just yet another reminder that keyboard maestro is at the foundation of, you know, all this automation on the Mac right now. It's really, really good stuff. So thank you for sharing that, Ken. I, I like those kinds of things. All right, John, I want to, uh, I want to talk about our two sponsors here. If that, uh, if that works for you, my friend, of course, sweet. Our first sponsor for today is simple contacts. So, you know, time is of the essence these days and going to the doctor. I don't know how you feel, but I'm not a big fan of spending my time in doctor's offices. Obviously, there's times when you need to go to the doctor, but if you can avoid that and still get everything that you everything done that you need to get done, then that's even better. It's even better if you can save money in the process. And this is what Simple Contacts allows you to do. So if you're someone who's already wearing contacts, you 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 know generally have to go for a vision test before you can get more contacts. Well, simple contacts takes care of that for you. And I did this, right? Uh, my wife, Lisa, she wears contacts and you know, it's always a pain in the neck. Oh, yeah, I got to go for the vision test so that they'll, you know, let me order more contacts, which is just how the, how the regulations work. Simple contacts does it in an app, either on your phone or you can do it on your computer. And uh, the vision test is actually overseen by uh, an ophthalmologist and, but the difference is it only costs 20 bucks when you do it with simple contacts, as opposed to, uh, you know, upwards of 200 bucks. If you're going to the eye doctor and it only takes five minutes in your house with Lisa, we did it with the phone. We set up the phone on like a chair that said, walk back 10 feet, tell us what letters you see. And then like the whole thing is, is then sent off to, for confirmation so that they can, the doctor can look at it and say, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you're good to go. And, uh, and then you're good to go. And then you get to order contacts from the service and the prices on these things, like Lisa was shocked looking at the prices. Uh, it, and again, this is, like I said, at the beginning of the episode, simplecontacts.com slash M G G. Uh, she thought what she would be getting is like generic versions of the contacts that she wore. You scan the barcode and, and they go, no, you get the actual con. She was shocked when the, when we opened the box, I'm like, yeah, of course it's the real thing. So you got to check this out. Go to simplecontacts.com slash M G G and then use coupon code M G G that will save you 30 bucks off of your, um, of your contacts. And then the eye exam is just 20 bucks. Now it, to be clear, this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam that you will still need uh, as often as you would need it. But in terms of the vision test, 20 bucks, and then you save 30 bucks off your contacts with simple contacts.com slash M G G coupon code M G G great stuff. Our thanks to simple contacts for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today, John is smile with pdf pen 10 can you believe it they're up to 10 versions of this thing or the 10th version of this thing pdf pen is the ultimate tool for editing pdfs i use it all the time both on my iphone as well as on my mac it just makes it super easy to do whatever i need to do signing documents populating things marking things up it just makes life super easy. And PDF Pen 10 now adds watermarks, custom footers and headers, and a new precision edit tool. You can move images around without increasing the size of your document. You can magnify library items. So if you got like your signature in the library or, um, you know, your like your name or whatever, uh, and it adds batch PDF Pen Pro 10 that is adds batch OCR support so that you can totally go paperless much easier now uh, by making a whole collection of scanned PDFs searchable. So check it out. Visit smilesoftware.com slash podcast and check out PDF Pen 10. Really great stuff. Great company over there with Smile. Our thanks to the folks at Smile and smilesoftware.com slash podcast for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Um, let's move to David. This is a question I get a lot. 
Uh, and David asks very simply, he says, uh, I've been subscribing to iTunes match since day one and to Apple music when it first came out, uh, from beats, but I'm confused. Why am I paying for both? Do I need to? I've read on Apple's site that Apple Music now includes Match, except for streaming on old Apple TVs that I no longer own. Spoke to an Apple rep who said I would lose all my DRM-free music. I have two or three copies of all my music, uh, and I listen to Apple Music in my car on CarPlay, and on my iPhone, and on my HomePod, and on the two 5K iMacs that we have. Uh, it's less so since he, they got the HomePod. Makes sense. Uh, he says, so do I need to pay twice? I'm a little miffed that Apple aren't clear about this. And I suggest millions are paying for services they don't need or use. Uh, the shorter answer is, I don't believe you need to pay for both. If you have Apple Music, you don't need to pay for iTunes Match. I had iTunes Match. Um, I had it when I signed up for Apple Music because it was 25 bucks a year. And my subscription had, did not expire on the same day that Apple Music started. So I had them both for a couple of months. And then I canceled iTunes match when my renewal came up and I still have all of um, all access to all of my DRM free music through iCloud music library and everything works very, very well. And I, I see evidence of that all the time. There was a day where I couldn't like it was last week or something where Apple music sign-ins were failing. Maybe it was two weeks ago. And so you couldn't stream uh, music that required, you know, Apple music an Apple music license. But I could still play all of my uh, my DRM free music that I had. Uh, it was you know that I had imported, and it would like that part was no problem. So yeah, I don't think you need iTunes Match. I think you're I think you're all right without it. You don't use either, right, John? Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on to Kevin. I'm curious to see where this one goes now, John. Uh, Kevin says i got uh on sale a connects my drive aka the me drive there was some naming conflict he says uh the thing was 12 dollars marked down from 80 it connects to a usb hard drive and allows it to be used like some sort of network drive it's supposed to support both smb and webdav but i've only ever gotten webdav to work and with the finder it works off and on the thing obviously has some issues otherwise they would still be supporting it but I digress. And that's why you got it for 12 bucks. Uh, he says, anyway, the thing is when I, when I try to copy files to it from the finder, it just sort of hangs. Yet if I use the terminal and copy things that way, it works. No problem. After some research, it appears, it appears as there's some problem with the web dev implementation in the finder. It can read and copy files from the device, just not to it. Do you know what's up? I can't find any information other than it doesn't work. Is there some reason for this? Um, so I, I, yes, I'm sure there's a reason for it. I, I think Apple just built the web dev client that way to be read only. Um, well, let's step back here. What okay. is web dev, Dave? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in a nutshell, web dev is using HTTP, which is the protocol that gives us the wondrous, uh, worldwide web. The web. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to dig down a bit, you're probably talking, either on port 80, which is insecure, or 443, which is secure HTTP. And it's using HTTP to transfer files. Is, is that a yeah, I, I, brief I, enough I, description of what like web it. dev essentially is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it stands for, I'm sorry, what does it stand for? It stands for, uh, 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 hold on, uh, web distributed authoring and versioning is what web dev John F. Braun, ladies represents. and gentlemen. <laughs> That's awesome. What I tell people here? No, there's RFCs I, no, about it, but like basically you know that it's stuff. a way to... It, it's it, awesome. You know, I mean, the nice thing about web dev is that almost any firewall or router or whatever allows traffic on ports 80 and 443, which right. is great. So if you got a client that supports that, well, then you got a home run. Though in yep. this case, though, I suspect because it was a... Uh, a questionable device here. I, I suspect that their web dev stack sucks. <laughs> no, well, I have heard about finder issues with it, with web dev too. In term, the same very thing he's uh, he's talking about. The writing it it does not write well to to web dev or consistently or reliably. But reading, okay. no problem. So yeah, so no we need an alternative. Correct. Hmm. Correct. 
You got one? John? I got one. Yeah, go. It's my favorite. Okay. Cyberduck. Oh. Ah, it's right. been around forever. Cyberduck is a multifaceted file transfer utility, and it supports all sorts of standards, including WebDAV, but also FTPS, uh, SFTP, two different kind of flavors here. But Cyberduck supports a lot of, um, supports all these standards. And uh, when I've had a need to do direct uh, protocol operations with one of these file transfer uh, yeah. options, I use Cyberduck. So that's one of them. But you have, you, I think you have one or two as well, Dave. I do. Which, uh, may, may be more uh, robust than uh, the alternatives. Maybe. I haven't used Cyberduck, so I can't speak to its robustness. But I have used Transmit from Panic, and that works great. Um, but, you know, and, and like Cyberduck, it does all of the things you just mentioned, right? It, you know, WebDAV, but also FTP in, in every flavor and, and way. And, and I like it because I can have windows saved. And so like, there's a lot of times where I need to FTP, uh, essentially sync a folder from my computer to an FTP server. And I can sort of have that saved as a, as a thing. And it just comes up and I don't have to think about it and it's all right there and I don't get it wrong. And uh, so transmits one option. And then I found another one from the folks at Eltima, E-L-T-I-M-A, called Commander One, uh, which they say is a free dual pane file manager for the Mac. And they say that it supports web dev. I have not tried it, but uh, but there's two things I like about it. One, that it is free. And number two, that on their page, uh, the icon for built-in file viewer is the... Uh, is the machine that my grandfather invented. So I, uh, I always like that. They've got a nice icon of the tower optical viewer machine there. So there you go. So you can check that out too. Good. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. All right. Moving on to Eric. Uh, where are we? Eric find you here. Eric writes <laughs> dear overlords of Mac land. <laughs> okay. I'll take it. Fine. Are we uh, overlords? I don't know. That, benevolence, that has maybe a negative. No, no, no. Benevolent. Yeah, because yeah. the overlord kind of has a negative connotation. Yeah, it's just I don't know. We have to, we have to embrace our overlordness. You know, like Ming the Merciless, and yeah, you know, it's just not nice people. Well, we th there have been some bad overlords, but you know, maybe there have been some good ones, and they just don't get a lot of uh, you know a lot of Press. play in the yeah. history books because <laughs> that's not interesting. You know, you trying to convince some tenth grader to learn. And they said, well, this was a good guy over here. What did he do? Well, you know, whatever the people wanted and it kept everything running good. Oh, okay. But then there was this other one that, you know, so it's a little more interesting. Anyway, uh, dear overlords of Mac land, when using disk, well, you know, we really don't know if Eric in intends this to be um, good or bad overlords. So we're applying our own uh, prejudice here. So we're just going to leave it at this. One more time, dear overlords of Macland, when using disk utility to erase or format a flash drive that will be used by several different Macs and PCs, what format scheme and uh, what format and scheme would you recommend? So I always go with uh, it's a great question because I, I always think I always stop to think about this every time I'm formatting a flash drive. So I would. Uh, I would go with the format of MS-DOS FAT and the scheme of master boot record. That's what I always go with. We're, you know, we're talking flash drives, not hard drives, not, not um, uh, you know, SSDs, you know, which are also flash media. I'm talking about thumb drives really is the right way to, to delineate this. And, and it's MS-DOS FAT and master boot record. But as we have all heard, my esteemed Fr colleague and good friend, Mr. John F. Braun feels like maybe there's something not right about that advice. So go. I think there's better advice. Okay. So if you look in the format menu. Yes. You will see the suggestion that my esteemed colleague made, which is MS-DOS FAT, mm -hmm. which stands for file allocation table. And I think that is actually FAT32. Okay. There's another choice. EX fat. All right. Which is newer. 
Okay. Here's the only problem I have. So the thing is, for for the most part, I would say Fat Thirty Two or 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 the the choice that you mentioned, I think for the most part is good enough. The only problem, and I remember we had somebody back in the mists of time talk to us about this. The one limitation that you have with Fat Thirty Two is that you're limited to a file size of four gigabytes. A file size. I think. Okay. Right, because I think it's doing. The, yeah, I believe. 2 to the 32, because it's using 32 bits for some operations, comes to 4 gigabytes. Is that right? I think that's right. Okay. Anyways, there's a limitation in, in, in FAT or FAT32. So you may want to consider, if you're working with large files, to work to do EXFAT instead. Huh. All right. And the option should show up in your menu. I, I don't believe it's showing up in the menu on my machine because I installed something optional. I'm, I'm curious if, if you see it as well, Dave. Yeah, no, I think it was there when I when I did this. I don't have a flash drive plugged into this computer right now, um, so I can't test it. <clears throat> but um, but yeah, I you know the reason that I went with that is I get a lot of flash drives, right, of varying sizes. Mm -hmm. These days, generally, you know, one gig on the low end, and I, I mean, routinely, I get sixteen gig flash drives, right, thumb drives. Uh, I've never seen one of them formatted to anything other than this. MS DOS mm -hmm. FAT, and so I that that's kind of where my. You're right, though. I mean, if you're working with large files, you're going to run into a, a brick wall if you if you have them formatted this way. But um, I, I guess I guess what I'm trying to think is, would there be any compatibility issues on the Windows side with using X? From what I've and probably I did not. some surfing, and the indication that I got is that EX FAT is a better cross-platform choice than okay. fat. All right. Well, there you go. So, there you go. That's the advice. Then X fat it is. Yeah. And, well, and, I, I try and make sure that your devices speak it. I mean, they should. I mean, any device that, that you know, like for example, the SD card, in my digital camera is right now formatted as, as the regular fat not the EX fat. Right. Because photos are, you know, not going to be larger, at least in my lifetime, than four gigabytes. So <laughs> there's really no need. <laughs> yeah, although if you were using your DSLR to shoot video, which a lot of people do, not every DSLR would, but, uh, right? I mean, sure. there, there are entire movies that have been shot on DSLR video. So, it, you know, it's possible. You got decent lenses and all that good stuff. Um, so, yeah, XFAT's, uh, what, 12 years old now? So, it's, I mean, that's pretty new. Uh, in, in file system, you know, parlance mm -hmm. or, uh, so 12 years, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. So people are saying that, uh, Vista sometimes doesn't like it, but also that Vista doesn't like a lot of stuff. So bear that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Vista. Oh, yeah. All right. Jurgen has a, where are we on time? Oh, all right. Cool. Plenty of time. Jurgen has. I skipped Vista. <laughs> A question that a lot of people did. Yeah. Uh, as a question that seems to come up usually around this time of year, uh, he says, I'm trying to find a router with a certain capability. What I want to do is the following when traveling, I want the router to be able to connect to an existing Wi-Fi and establish an internet connection with that. So that we'll call that Wi-Fi one. So it's, you're in a hotel room. You want the router wirelessly to connect to the hotel's Wi-Fi. And then he says, step two is that I want the router to create another Wi-Fi, which we'll call Wi-Fi two, that I then can connect my other devices to. The result uh, would be me being able to use the internet connection with my devices connected to Wi-Fi two, and there's some security benefits and and such to doing that. Uh, so what you want is something uh, that I think I would generically call a travel router. And they do exist. They generally only exist at the um, 802.11n level. I don't know why that, I mean, I guess it's just for cost. You're not, you know, your, your hotel Wi-Fi is not going to, you don't need to go huge ranges with AC and, um, or huge speeds because your hotel Wi-Fi is not going to give you huge speeds anyway. <laughs> um, so there is, there are um, a couple of articles that I'll put in the show notes here. But really, it seems like the best one uh, to, to get is, I'm, I want to make sure I get this right. It, I'm pretty sure it's a TP-Link one. Oh, no, no, sorry. It's not. It's the Hutu wireless travel router. Uh, and it's available for 20 bucks. TP-Link has one too, 
that'll be in, in one of the lists, but that it, uh, based on everything that I was kind of going through and, and crisscrossing and mis- mixing and matching all the feature sets, this Hutu one very specifically says that it can bridge an existing Wi-Fi wireless network and create your own secure Wi-Fi, which is exactly what, um, <laughs> what, what Jurgen wants to do here. So, so there you go. 20 bucks at Amazon. Oh, all right. Wouldn't it, would, uh, I'm just wondering. So TP link, uh, you caught my attention because I have one of their extenders. Would, would one of their extenders no. scroll? No, because it's not no. going to act okay. as a router. You need something that's going to act as a router to create that separate network. Okay. So the, the TP link one is the N 300, but I'm not entirely certain that it will do what we, what, what Jurgen wants. I don't, I don't know that it'll grab Wi-Fi and, and then create another Wi-Fi network. It will grab ethernet and create another Wi-Fi network. Uh, but so that's why, and it's 35 bucks instead of 19, but um, okay. Yeah. I remember back in the day I used my airport extreme for that sort of thing only, but again, that wasn't, Oh no, you could, right. Could you, could it create a separate network or was it just uh, doing WDS and echoing, right? Essentially creating like your own little quasi mesh. Right? I'm pretty sure there was a way to say, okay, log into this other access point and yep. then you have a different name and then let me talk to you. Yeah. I so we kind of mass the fact, it yeah. would kind of mask the fact that, you know, because a lot of hotels, they'd be like, well, you got to pay per device. And it's like, yeah, it used to crazy. be that you had to pay per device. That's right. Yeah. Less so now. All right. Well, yeah. my, my device is the airport express. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Fooled you. <laughs> I still remember that we, we, we would do that when we were, you know, back in the day when, oh, sure. uh, you know, we were, we were economizing. It's like, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll share, I'll share my room's internet and then everybody can hop on my access point. Mm-hmm. It was so much fun. Well, yeah, and you can do it with your, I mean, if, if there is Ethernet and you have an Ethernet port on your MacBook, which not all of them have, of course, um, then you can you can share your Internet connection that way, too, is, you know, right, you, right. you can create uh, a network right from there. So, so uh, right. we will put links to all of those in the show notes and, uh, and we'll take it from there. All right, uh, we've got a couple more things. I don't know exactly where we're going to wind up. We went kind of long on the home stuff. Um, I do want to take a minute, though, and thank all of our premium subscribers that contributed this week. Uh, we, like, I always say it, and it, because it's always true, we couldn't do this without you. And, I, and, and that's true of everybody that listens and contributes questions and all that stuff. Um, now, obviously, we call out your name when when you send in a question, and, and it that's it both in um, just to specify, but also in appreciation because you you help us create the content for this show, so we really appreciate it. Uh, we also appreciate our premium subscribers who send in um, make financial contributions right to the show, and so this month or this week rather uh, on the ten dollar monthly plan, we had contributions from Olga P. Jason A, Bob P, Michael L, The B Man, Abdullah B, no relation, Paul M, Mike C, Mark R, Dave Dave C, Neil L, and of course, Bob over at Working Smarter for Mac Users. We love Dr. Bob. We love all of you. So thank you to all of you who contributed. It's really great. Um, On the $25 biannual plan, we have Lou R., Wayne B, Doug A, Chris F, Scott R, Ed T, David B, Craig R T, David S, Robert S, and Andrew W. Thanks to all of you so much for what you do. It really makes a huge difference here. All right, John, are you back? I never went away. Did you turn off your mic, though? No. Oh, I heard there was like some major crackling that I heard. I thought it was oh, a switch I on your actually microphone. actually plugged a USB device into my hub. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry about that. We heard that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you know, this sort of came up. I mean, it came up in pre-show because I, I put it there. But um, I, I wanted to have a conversation. And while we're on the whole home thing uh, about 
TiVo and Comcast X1. And, and the real reason is I was having this conversation with, with a client and, you know, my, I, I've been a TiVo household basically since they started doing it. I've been, my daughter is 18 and a half this summer. And so we will have been TiVo customers for 18 years. We bought TiVo six months after she was born when we realized uh, we wanted to be able to time shift television so, so that we could watch on our schedule because her schedule was not uh, compatible with what we wanted to do. So, uh, so we've been TiVo customers for a very, very long time. And we've, we've lived through the transition from having, well, we started with one TiVo box, then we went to multiple TiVo boxes, uh, one for each TV or whatever, to sort of the new paradigm of TiVo, which is that you have one box in the house on which you pay your TiVo service and all of that stuff. And for us, that's a TiVo Bolt. And then we have uh, TiVo Minis on the other televisions that all feed from the data that's on the Bolt or stream from the internet, if you want to stream Netflix or whatever, because it does all that too. And really, TiVo was, as, as, as far as I was concerned, the only answer for doing this. Other companies had come out with things. Obviously, you know, different cable companies had their own options and there were other stuff, but the user interface was awful and uh, on those things and TiVo really kind of had it. it. It reminded me of the old days um, where, and, and it, this may be hard for some of you to believe, uh, but there was a time when Windows computers were way more popular and, and Apple stuff was seen as like for, you know, toys for kids to use. But those of us that use the Apple stuff knew that it was a way better interface and all that stuff. So kids, you can ask your parents about it, about all that if this seems like totally foreign to you. But um, I felt the same way about TiVo, right? It was like I tried some of these other things. And when we initially tried the Comcast DVR, my kids, that was the, the time that my kids got to learn the F word. Uh, because they heard daddy, <laughs> daddy say it over and over and over again to the television. Uh, so, so, you know, I mean, it was a learning opportunity for them and, and, you know, they learned proper uh, cursing technique, but, um, but you know, like that's not necessarily the mindset that you want to be in when you're trying to relax and watch but the, TV. Option, the other options sucked. And I think well, some that's of them what I'm still saying. do. Yeah. Though I know they got a lot better. Well, the, the one that you mentioned, I, I, from what I've seen, well, I haven't mentioned that, it yet. Oh, um, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But you will. Yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so anytime someone would ask, I would say, well, yeah, I, you know, TiVo. And I would always back that up by saying, even if we had just finished having the worst month that we had and we didn't have any extra money in the budget and our TiVo died today, we would just go out and buy another TiVo because that was just the only way. Right. Um, that's not true for me anymore. I don't think I would do that because, you know, your TiVo is going to cost you somewhere in the three to $500 range. And then you're either going to pay 15 bucks a month for the service on TiVo, or you're going to pay, you know, somewhere in the two to $400 range for a lifetime uh, TiVo service. And that's the, the line unit. I drew in the sand is that every TiVo that I've gotten, Dave, and yeah. also my family both my, my sister and my parents, uh, I, I blessed them or showed them the way. Yeah. And we all have lifetime. Yeah. And it, it, I, I'm with you. If it wasn't for them offering a way to go from my Series 3 to the Bolt and transfer my lifetime, I'm not sure I would have gotten their latest unit. Sure. And that makes sense. And they're always, they're always willing. Like if you are a TiVo customer with a lifetime on a box and the box dies or something, call them. There is always a path. Uh, you'll have to pay something, but there's always a path to migrate your lifetime stuff around. Uh, but I, even with that, uh, you know, you're looking at, and then you're, and then for the TiVo mini boxes, those are, I think 150 bucks a piece. So it's very easy to spend a thousand bucks to get your house set up with TiVo. Um, and that's a lot of money, you know? And so I don't think I would do that if, if, and when my TiVo box dies, I don't, I don't know that I would get another one. Uh, at this point, I think I would go with Comcast's X one service, which provides a lot of the same type of functionality. The only, my only big problem with the Comcast thing is that it's obsessed with showing me live TV at all times. We have it. So the cable package that we, that we subscribe to here comes with an X one box. So 
they, they were like, well, you don't need it. Cause you, you have TiVo. I'm like, well, then can I get money back every month for that? They're like, no. And I said, well then give me the X one box. I want to test it out. So I have, I've got it in the bedroom. I use it very, very infrequently, but it works. The user interface is fine. Similar to TiVo, it's got voice control, so I can say things like yesterday afternoon. I just wanted to see what was going on with the Bruins game because it was, you know, like the last game or was it turned out to be the last game of the series or whatever. Uh, And so, you know, trying to find the game that's on and navigating and having to like type with your with the remote Bruins and hunt around. Well, I don't with TiVo, you know, in the voice, the Vox remote, I just hold the remote and I press the button and I say Bruins and boom shows me the game that's playing and it lets me just switch to it, right? Comcast X1 has the same type of thing. I can just say it. It's got one passes and all that stuff and it's got remote boxes. So I could feed the rest of my house with all of the Comcast X1 stuff. So it's really, I just wanted to share this because we've talked a lot about TiVo over the years. Now, I haven't lived with X1 as my main TV. It might very well be that if the TiVo died today, we would jump to the X1 and then uh, a month later say, oh, this is awful and jump to, you know, back to TiVo. But for someone that's starting out, start with the X1 or if your provider, I know Comcast is, I think, I think the most popular provider in the, in the States here. But uh, see what your provider's got to offer. You you know, I mean, f- for the scenario I just described, it would cost me like 20 bucks to test the X1 for a month. Well, you know, that's that's way less than a grand. So, so there you go. Uh, and Brother Jay is asking, when is the TiVo listening without your knowledge? Uh, to my knowledge, both of these remotes only listen when you press the voice button on the remote. I mean, these are battery powered devices. So if they were listening all the time, uh, the batteries would die very, very quickly and they don't. So I, I tend to believe them when they say they o- are only listening when you push the button. So, so there you go. Those are my, those are my thoughts on that, John. Did that, did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Yeah, and cable vision or whatever you want to call them this week. Um, <laughs> Optimum yeah. cable vision. Sure. Altice, I think, is now they got acquired by. But, okay. Uh, they offer a similar virtual DVR. My only discomfort with that is that I kind of like having the content on what I consider my hard drive because you get some flexibility with what you can do with it. Well, um, so you're assigning a a a. Fe- a lack of feature that I, I don't think is accurate with the X one. You can do the cloud DVR thing, but um, I, I, I thought it was saving that content locally too. Oh, all right. I, I might I be know. wrong about no, that like, though. I'd like I, to know. Yeah, I could be wrong. The about perception that. I get with a lot of these virtual, what I'll call virtual DVRs is that the, the con- none of the content is stored with you but I could be wrong because I haven't worked with any of them. Yeah. So it's just, again, it's I, thought my it, perception I thought it had a 500 gig hard drive in it, but I, I, I may be misinterpreting that. Um, I mean, yeah. that, that would be one of like caution with non TiVo devices is, is, you know, if your net connection is gone, can you still watch your stuff? Of course, in the case of the TiVo where it's on the hard drive, of course you can. Or, right. But, you know, if it's like Netflix or something like that, then you're, you're out of luck. So, um, but that's a, that, that's a concern with any cloud service. Sure. Uh, if your, if your network connection goes away, sorry, Charlie, unless it's replicated locally. So. Yeah, I might, I might be wrong on this, John. It might be totally cloud DVR and, and that you get 500 gigs of cloud storage with it. Now, it, when we say cloud though, we're not talking about internet based cloud necessarily. I mean, it is, but you're getting it in a, in a different way because it's coming direct from Comcast. So it's, it's not using your internet bandwidth to do this. I don't think. I th- and I th- for people that are interested, I mean, I used my mad Google skills here and I just did a search on Comcast X1 DVR local storage. Yeah. And the first article that comes up is called X1 DVR storage versus cloud DVR storage. And I'm not going to read the article to you, but if you want to learn about it and I'm going to read it, after we're done with the show <laughs> and see what they have to say about it, because apparently I'm not the only one that has that question. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Huh? All right. Well, uh, 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 uh. I'm looking quickly here. 
Oh yeah, no, it is. It, there's a it, based on what I'm reading here, there is a hard drive in the thing. And, oh great! And okay. then there's cloud storage too. So, huh? Okay. All right. Well. Uh, yeah, and Michael King is confirming that in the chat room that it uh, it has a hard drive built in. So yeah, that's what it felt like when I was using it. It was very you know, um, it it yeah felt like it was local. Like that's the best I can say. Sweet. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Uh, and the only thing with TiVo, Dave, especially with the Bolt. Yeah. They should have... The, the shape annoys me. I'm well, sorry. The, sh the shape is so that it doesn't have to have a big loud fan running all the time. Yeah, because it, it, the shape it, keeps it, you from... It's not square. Right. It's not square so that you can't stack something on top of it and overheat the components. But I don't like the hard that. Drive. I, yeah. Well, you would like less... If the thing had a big honking fan or the hard drive uh, burned out your circuitry, you know, twice a year. So. Right. Yeah. And actually, now that you mentioned it, I think we talked about this before. Eero took a similar uh, uh, design approach. The Eero device discourages you from putting something on top of it because it's curved and right. not flat. Yep. That's true. And I think I read that in one of their documents. Whoa. They're like, we don't put something on top of me, man. And, and I'm going to kind of enforce this with physics. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to make it very difficult. If you put something on top of me, it will likely fall off. Yeah. Yeah. Or a cat will come along and knock it off, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. There. Let's, um, let's, let's go to Chuck here. Let's see. Let's see how yes. we do. Chuck asks, he says, I upgraded from a late 2013, 27 inch iMac to a late 2015, 27 inch uh, 5k iMac with a one terabyte fusion drive in it. He says, I've noticed a few things just feel sluggish when switching from app to app. For example, sometimes when I click on the finder, which I always have open on a second monitor, there's a spinning ball for about a second before it's responsive. Another example is if I click on the launch pad icon, it takes a few seconds for it to be responsive. I'm guessing this is because it's a fusion drive and not an SSD, which is what I was used to. So I started looking at maxsales.com and for some reason, uh, it doesn't come up with a listing that I could put in an SSD internally. Um, if I did, which one would you recommend? Also, would I be better served increasing the RAM instead? Um, so uh, here are some things to talk about. And I skipped over this part of his, his thing. Uh, but an external SSD, you know, removing and replacing internal drives in an iMac is often not the best use of your time and risk to your machine um, with Thunderbolt or even USB three, you can uh, you can really get a fine experience that for the most part is no different from the experience you would have with an internal drive, just using an external drive and boot from that. So if you choose to go the SSD route, uh, either a USB three or Thunderbolt external drive would uh, almost certainly make you very, very happy uh, and keep you from having to rip your iMac apart. Uh, and then you could continue to use the fusion drive for extra storage. Um, I would, and doing that, I'd probably go USB three just because you probably don't need the relative speed increase for Thunderbolt Thunderbolt. And you can avoid the, uh, you know, the Thunderbolt tax because the, there's money involved there. And yeah. Cables and reviewing and USB three, I think last I checked is five gigabits per second. Yep. Right. Yep. And Thunderbolt is on the order of tens of gigabits per second. But with a single but drive, all... you're not going to hit those speeds. You know? Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. That was just why no, I I'm with you. The, yeah. the other point I want to make is that the, the, and I saw this especially when I got the, uh, so I had the 2014 Mini. Yeah. Apple puts crummy, crummy rotational drives in their machines always have yep <laughs> yeah so the first thing i did when i got this they actually put a sata 2 drive in this machine and dude this has a sata 3 interface and it was a sata 2 drive it was locked to sata 2 and i'm like you're gone and i had to put that ssd in there and it was like night and day yes Continue. sorry no no it's totally fine fine no problem uh uh let's see so the um you might be right that this is an SSD thing versus a fusion drive thing. Um, but I'm not convinced of that. I've used a lot of machines with fusion drives and it, you know, unless there's a problem with the fusion drive, 
I'm not seeing sluggishness just moving around in the finder or anything like that. You know what I mean? It just like, I, that, I don't think that's your issue. If it is, then reinstalling the OS fresh would most likely fix that, or at least identify their, uh, that there's a problem somewhere, but I don't, I don't think that's the, um, well, I, I mean, you, you got to quantify the, I mean, so the spinning ball is a good piece of data. Yeah. Um, but you're going to want to either get activity monitor or something like iStat menus and that you may have a bottleneck somewhere. And uh, those are the tools that are going to help you identify where exactly that bottleneck is. Is it because you don't have enough for RAM? You know? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's not enough RAM, then you want to check your page in and page outs and, you know, all that great stuff and just see what's happening there. Yep. I I am nearly certain his problem is would be solved by increasing the RAM. He says, uh, really, because he, he, he says he's got eight okay. gigs, eight gigs of RAM. I, I mean, eight gigs is is I don't know. I, it, do you find it? Do you have a machine with with eight in it, John? My mini has eight, and my uh, so my mini, which is the newer machine, has yep. eight, and my MacBook Pro, which is my daily driver, and is the older machine, actually has sixteen. Okay. Okay, and I've I find it at eight. I think is a bare minimum these days. For, yeah, yeah. For any machine. Yeah, I just don't like moving around in the Finder, seeing a spinning beach ball. That's just weird to me. I like. I'm not. It, I, I don't. In that I don't case, see that you as may a hard wanna, issue. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering because we've had. I mean, what it sounds like is he's moving from app to app. It's not just that he's clicking the find a, a second finder window. It's moving from whatever app he might be running. And we, and we don't have that data here, uh, but it's possible. Chuck is running very Ram hungry apps. I mean, if, if he's let Safari run for more than 24 hours, that's one, uh, you know, but maybe he's running things and doing, you know, some video editing or photo editing or something. But this sounds like that whole swapping thing where, you know, when he switches from whatever app he's in to another app, a.k.a. the Finder, then it like there's that lag of, oh, let me catch up here and do that, which is why I, I really like my gut just says Ram all day long on this. Yeah, I mean the other thing could be caches. You know how much we love caches. Totally true. Yeah, could yeah. be some caches. So you may want to do a safe boot. You may want to, um, and actually, yes, we got a suggestion from uh, from the chat room. Check your memory pressure in Activity Monitor. Yes. Yeah. So memory pressure, um, I think, is a non quantifiable value. But the thing is, if it's or it's a dimensionless. I'm, I'm trying to think exactly what yeah, it's called. But you can right, get this information. Right. Memory pressure, the thing is, memory pressure, if it's too high, that basically means the system is doing a heck of a lot of work doing memory compression and stuff like that so that it's it, it, it's trying to avoid swapping. So checking right. that value. Right. And you can do that in both Activity Monitor or, last I checked, uh, you can do it in iStat menus as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. I step menus. Will it show? In mine right now, pressure? I'm looking. So the pressure on my mini here is 44%, which I think is fine because it, it, it I think that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Working for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So I, but I, like I said, it, you know, in another way to test, maybe you've got some app running in the background that is causing trouble. So start up in safe mode and see what that, you know, does it respond any differently? It's tough to work for m any great length of time in safe mode. And you will notice, potentially notice graphics being slower, like screen redraws and things like that in safe mode. Cause it doesn't generally load the faster graphics drivers there. But, um, but anyway, there you go. Uh, where are we on time? Do you have John, do you think we can do Andrew? Andrew, the, we uh, can do quickly. All right, yes. well then let's go. Cool. All right. Well, let me dive in, though we both answered it. But um, Andrew has a question. And he says, Hi, David, John. To get do you, you have any. There, John? I, hear, I hear the motorcycles coming coming up and down your street. Yeah, it's like it's like Mad Max out here. You know? Okay. It's, it's oh, that's crazy. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, cool. it's warm, man. Biker weather. Right. <laughs> and scooters and, and all sorts of people yeah, yeah. are everywhere. I don't, I don't know what, what's up with them. All right. <laughs> so, anyways, hi, Dave and John. Do you have any suggestions for a 128 gigabyte to 256 gigabyte internal SSD to be used in a 2009 X serve? 
You may ask yourself, what the heck is that? Yeah, kids, we'll kids address ask that in a moment here. Yeah, right. I would like the best performance with great reliability. Plus, will it require a separate app to turn on trim, considering that the X serve is still running Mac OS server for 10.6.8? So, going back in history here, XServe was Apple's entry into the rack mount server market. And it was a pretty cool machine. And actually, back in the day, I actually had one to play with as someone working, uh, running a data center and, and playing with servers and stuff. But here's the answer. Well, Dave had an answer and said, Dave said, I had good luck with SSDs from Crucial and OWC. Yeah. Um, and and that they, is and true. they kind of cross-pollinate. Yeah. And then you said, do you have different advice, John? So I do have some different advice here. And I'll, so I'll it, just just here. to be clear, because I know most of you don't have X serves. This is, you know, very generic advice for uh, adding an SSD to an older Mac as, as well. Any, any of these things, certainly that I've suggested, and I think what you're going to suggest are, you know, very generic for, for older Macs. Yes, but I do have something specific for this machine. Of course. So anyways, you do. looking at yeah. the specs, this machine came with, even though it was in 2009, came with a SATA 2 interface. And SATA 2 is 3.0 gigabits per second. So it's not the latest standard. The latest I think is SATA 3, which is 6 gigabits per second. But um so you're going to want to make sure that the SSD that you choose supports that at least out of two, though the caution I would enter is that we have had people tell us in the past, you may want to up your cable game because sometimes if you have an older SATA 2 cable and it's talking to a newer, even if it's talking SATA 2 and it's a SATA 3 device, weird things may happen. But then I did a little more digging, Dave. And as far as the brands, I mean, I think anybody who's been in business for more than 10 years. Um, so OWC and Crucial are certainly good vendors, but you know, um, Samsung, SanDisk, Kingston, Western Digital, Seagate, anybody who's been making drives for more than a few years, I would say is a good choice for an SSD. But yeah, I would agree with um, that. Yeah. Uh, look for refurbs. Crucial, for example, they have a page where you can get notifications when they have refurbished drives. Um, so if you want to save some coin here. But then what I found, Dave, is... OWC actually makes a kit that combines my suggestions here and that they offer their SSD with an enclosure. And that's the other thing. So SSDs are three and a half inch or two and a half inch. And most uh, full size drives are larger. Well, you're going to need a bracket. Well, they actually have, and we'll link to it. And I found the link to the product. They actually have a product that includes their SSD and an enclosure. So you can just slide it right into your XServe. Huh? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, let me tug it up here. Yeah, it, OWC <laughs> SSD flash storage upgrade for XServe G5 Xeon, which I believe is the machine that he has there. Yeah. And cool. that's it. And now, he said that he found some prices for SSDs that were crazy. And uh, in this case, I'm looking here. So they have a couple of kits. The one with the enclosure, they have... Uh, it starts at 60 gigs for $52 all the way up to two terabytes for 639, which I think are, are well, that's pretty decent prices. Seems pretty reasonable. Yeah. For yeah. One exactly. of their SSDs. Yeah. So, um, I go for that. So I think you can breathe new life into the machine. Um, yeah. By getting an SSD, you know, we now the did... trim thing. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, the only thing I'm thinking is, yeah, I mean, for optimum efficiency, you do want trim. Um, the older OS, as far as I know, Dave, uh, especially what did he say, ten point six, does He's not, not have yeah. does not have the trim the trim command from the terminal, and I'm not sure if well, he could run older, trim enabler. I think it'll take care of it. Uh, yeah, there's right? a few third party utilities that'll do the magic to to enable yeah. trim. So yeah. I'd agree, well, trim well, trim is necessary to get optimum write performance, not sort really of read performance, but I think. I think it mostly affects the right performance and that if, if you don't have trim enabled, then your right performance will degrade over time. Whereas if you have it enabled, then everything's cool. Yep. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. Um, I did a, a series of surveys on Twitter, John, from the Mac Observer Twitter account, asking people how old their daily driver Macs were. And for the laptop crowd, it was 60% 
of the folks that answered 62%, I believe with laptops. Oh no, 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 no. Laptops was slightly lower. Uh, it was like 59% of laptop owners that people that used a laptop as a daily driver were using a machine four years old or older. And I think 20% were using a machine that was seven years old or older on, um, on the desktops, it was a little higher. I think it was 64% at four plus years and almost 30, like 25 at seven plus years. And, you know, the reality is, and I, the, the reason I, I did this, oh, and then, and then I asked, take your daily driver out of the equation. What's the oldest Mac that you use at least once a month? And I think the number was 80% were using a Mac that was over seven years old once a month. So, and this, you know, these surveys sort of uh, came out of curiosity based on me realizing, holy crap, I've got two Macs in my house that are each 10 years old at least. And they're fully functional, like fully functional. And, and part of what makes them functional is that they have SSDs in them, right? Several years ago, I, I migrated them all to SSD. And now they're great. They they can't run Sierra or High Sierra, so that will be their eventual downfall. But um, but you know they they run really well. They do everything that's needed, and it's because you know we we moved from having single core processors to dual core processors, and you know our needs um, simultaneous with that, our needs just you know haven't changed a whole lot in the last 10 years. But what's interesting is 10 years ago, when these machines were purchased, you were buying a new computer every three years, you know, no ma almost no matter what. So it's really interesting to have, you know, this computer just lasting and lasting. And uh, I mean, it's great. So, so that's, you know, uh, that's where, you know, we resurface some of these, these things where it seems to us like everybody might already have SSDs and all that stuff, but, um, but not necessarily. You know, and you can really breathe new life into those older Macs by doing this. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, my, my life at home is a testament to that. In fact, my laptop is still a 2011 uh, MacBook Air and it works great for me. And that's things seven years old now, which is just crazy. So there you go. Yeah. I'm still tickled though, when you, you come over and, and you start uh, giving it a workout and I can hear those fans spinning up there. Oh, Sure. Yeah, of course. But then it has a wimpy, well, what is it, a 1.4 gig processor? Yeah. So, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it works great. Uh, it really, it's, you know, it's yeah. awesome. But then I imagine you get, uh, I don't, I probably don't get a full day out of my machine, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you can get a full day out of it. No, air. no, because I got really? the 11, oh, okay. well, because I'm running the 11 inch air, which had the really small battery. So I only get a few hours. Oh, okay. um, but if I had gotten the 13, yeah, I bet I'd be getting, you know, quite a bit out of it. But yeah. It's good stuff. All right. So, yeah, so yeah, I put that link in there. So, yeah, cool. uh, OWC comes to the rescue. They have a kit that will totally <laughs> do this. Trick out you. your excerpt. That's great. All right. Well, uh, I want to make sure we say thank you to all of you once again for listening, for contributing, for checking out our sponsors, you know, all of that good stuff. Uh, I want to thank Cashfly, C A C H E F L Y dot com which provides all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Um, we didn't tell them how to contact us. So you get one option this week. We like to not overload you folks. And our, we're already running past our normal time. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the place to email us. Right, John? What he said. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com, unless you're a premium subscriber, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is one of your perks, and we we prioritize those. Uh, I want to thank all the sponsors in our podcast marketplace, right? Uh, we have, um, well, let's see. Let me pull up the list. We have Otherworld Computing. We have Bare Bones. We have, which is great with BB Edit. We have RoboForm at RoboForm.com. Of course, we have the sponsors we mentioned in this episode. We have Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. We have simplecontacts.com slash MGG. And don't forget to check out the great deals on Ring at ring.com slash MGG. Great stuff. Great sponsors. Got to check it out. 
We'll see you next week. Or I'll see you tomorrow in Princeton if you're going to be there. Listen, uh, if you're going to come to Princeton, have fun because that's what they do. And they have a good meeting and then and then they uh, go out for pizza afterwards at Conti's, which is great. It's like, that's the reason people go, right? It just, yeah, so Dave's there. So what? Dave spoke. Now let's go to Conti's and, you know, we'll have some fun. But the important thing to remember is if you're, if you're going to do that, that you don't get caught. Made up.